Our next speaker is Aviv Ben Yosef. He's an advisor, coach, and consultant for executives and leaders throughout the tech industry. Throughout his career, he has helped companies worldwide, from fresh startups to the Fortune 100 and everything in between. The result are teams and cultures his clients are proud to lead. The title of his talk is Experience Pressure Cookers, Teams That Propel People Forward. Please put your hands together for Aviv Ben Yosef. All right. Okay, eventually we're going to get my slides here, I'm guessing. So let's start in the meantime. I'm guessing that if you've been going to conferences for engineering leadership for a while, you noticed that the last year or so, things seem to be a bit different. When I went to engineering leadership conferences two years ago, for example, what were we talking about? Everyone were busy about our hiring pipelines. How do we bring more people in? How do we interview them faster? How do we onboard all of those people we're getting in? And talking about hyperscale, about scaling up, etc., was going on everywhere. Not exactly what we're seeing nowadays in most tech companies, most startups. Uh, I did an exercise yesterday and I opened up a bunch of companies on LinkedIn and you know there's this graph that shows you how many employees they have over time. It was pretty hard to find someone that's not Amazon that didn't show quite a dip. So right now, things in tech are different. Being a leader in tech is different and frankly, you know, Putting aside those companies that are going to close shop, I'm happy because I think that this is what we need to create really good teams that actually have meaning. And this is sort of what we're going to be talking about today. How can we leverage the fact that teams are now growing slower and create things that are amazing? And this starts from my experience, as you're going to get to in a second, of my first job. And I'll tell you why it's a job in air quotes. But I also worked with a lot of companies in Israel, where I'm from, in Europe, in the States. And I think that we have a lot of things that were, you know, there are low hanging fruit that we can reach to if we try. And we just need to be aware of it. We just need to see that the, the trees are out here. So this is what we're going to be talking about. Okay. And I read a few books about this, but no one likes reading books. I know that even though I wrote books. Um, and therefore, at the end, I'm just going to give you a link to get a PDF of the gist. All right? So let's get going. We need, you know, the effect for flashback in a TV series. Let's go about 18 years back. And I, as most Israelis, had to enlist to the army. Lucky for me. I wasn't a real soldier. I got to be a coder because I was a nerd and they knew that. And what was amazing is that I was 18 years old. I knew how to code because, you know, I learned by myself with books, etc. But I never really worked as a software engineer. We weren't using the term software engineer. We were coders. And still, what we were doing somehow worked. We're a bunch of 18 year olds and we were doing things that actually delivered results. And more than that, I was at the subunit that's the equivalent in Israel of the American NSA, if you know what that means. However, you know, the States is this, Israel is this. We have like, I don't know, a fraction of a percentage of the budget. Everyone at the NSA are like PhDs, and we are a bunch of 18-year-olds. And still, we were doing things that sometimes even for them were amazing. And this sensation was something that really stuck with me. What was going on over there that enabled that? And how is that possible that we were 18, 19, responsible for systems that if they're down, literally someone might die because we lose intelligence. And yet, you know, 
it works. I look at all the startups I help, and they have all of these people with tens of years of experience and pager duty and everything, and they seem to be having more problems than we did. How does that compile? So this is like a set of thoughts and, and tips that I have to try and mimic what I saw working back then, 18 years ago. But I do want to say that I don't think we were a special case. One example that I came across on the internet that I really like, the Apollo 11 control room. Okay, this is another life and death sort of scenario. The average age here of the people you see was 20 something. Okay, they weren't all PhDs. Nowadays at NASA, the average age has risen to 47 for this. But back then, things were possible. And I'm guessing you've heard of WhatsApp and Instagram that when they were acquired by Facebook, they had hundreds of millions of users and yet each had about a dozen engineers. And this is before AWS was a monster, before creating a cloud was something that you did like that. It's like 12 engineers. They had a native Android app, native iPhone app, backend, amazing scale for the time. Now I'm seeing teams that have more than that, you know, engineers just for the homepage, right? Or maintaining the WordPress blog. How does that work? What, what, what are we missing? So this is like what I want to try and uncover here. Some ways that we can turn our thinking around and create things that are more like this and less like what you might be experiencing or seeing, okay? And I have one example that's, you know, I'm, not th I'm not saying that Elon Musk is a good example for almost anything. However, you can't deny that, you know, people are tweeting or Xing about this conference right now, even though they have dropped from, I don't remember, to a few thousands to less than a thousand employees, right? It works somehow. It just goes to show that sometimes smaller teams can achieve amazing things. And the question is, how can we get there? And what are we going to do to create that? Or at least get more of that. Now, what's stopping you right now from being in such an, an environment where people are delivering amazing results, where people are growing really, really fast. I remember that when I was 18 and I started coding, I felt like a baby that was given a keyboard. But when I was 19, in hindsight, I wasn't that good, but I, I, I could see the amazing progress I made. And at 20, 21, 22, when I finished my service and I went to work, I felt like I already knew everything there was to know. Um, but, you know, putting aside being stupid as a young person, I do know that the growth was there. We were growing a lot faster than you're seeing around you. So why, why isn't that happening for most companies? First, there's the problem that we just think that it's not supposed to happen. This is a self-fulfilling prophecy. I have friends working at Google, working at Microsoft, and they know that unless something supernatural happens, they're not gonna get promoted before X amount of years have passed. It's like, even if you're amazing at work, no one's gonna give you a promotion to the next level before at least two years have passed. What does that mean? People work really hard only 12, six months before the promotion window opens. They just don't expect to grow, so they don't grow as fast as they can. And this is something that we see all over the place. You hire a junior person, in your mind, someone remains a junior at least for three years, you're gonna treat them like a junior person, that's what's gonna happen. They are not as likely to grow if they see that the expectations for being good at work is that you can keep being juniorish. Second, I think that every manager has this daily battle, constant battle of trying to balance the short term. We need to get results by the end of the sprint because we still have estimates and you haven't stopped doing them since this morning. And you're trying to hit the deadline, show that you're a good manager, that you have an effective team. And because of that, 
we're not letting people experiment, right? That's why I'm guessing NASA now has people who are a lot more experienced in teams. That's why we tend to give the person who is most experienced with a task to work on that task, right? That's the safe option, that's the fastest option, and what we're doing is we're not optimizing for people's growth. And this is connected to the fact that we are afraid as a culture to have any setback. Like, when my kids learned how to walk, if I kept running and moving everything in their path, they probably would never have learned how to walk, at least not until they were like seven. But you realize that it's okay for something to be on the way eventually, and they're gonna have to learn how to walk around it or step over something. You have to let people make small mistakes. I'm not saying blow up the website on Black Friday, but let them have these mistakes, have the extra time that it takes to learn, or you're gonna create this sort of environment that's just overprotecting them. We're making sure that no one gets offended, no one feels like they are not doing things well enough, no one is to blame for any outage, and we're trying to cuddle people way too much. And lastly, I see this especially with startups that have grown, that we have a lot of heroism. Either us as leaders want to be heroes or feel like we have to be heroes, or you have the more senior core of your startup where those individual contributors are, you know, there's the bad sign and they know that they need to jump in because there's an outage, because there's a bug. You have those people who you can always count on to come in and save your behind. The problem is that as nice as that is, because it means that sometimes you don't have to wake up in the middle of the night to handle a bug, the problem with that is that sometimes what you're getting is that people don't get to experience these experiences which are amazing growth opportunities. When there's a bug, when you, you're not sure about something, when you have to do something really fast, you have to learn from it and you have, you have to find a solution on the spot, that's usually where you grow the fastest and we're not letting our people get there. And we want to sort of snap out of that sort of thinking. And just so you get a sense and I'm trying to paint a picture of how that looks, I keep saying to my clients that it's possible to triple impact per engineer, okay? I'm not saying that we're expecting engineers to go clickety-clack three times faster, okay? No mechanical keyboard is gonna do that. You're not gonna send them to touch typing school. That's not tripling impact. Tripling impact is about creating a team that delivers results a lot faster. And we can see teams that are small, that get more results than bigger companies. Um, even personally, when I used to be a freelance coder, I would go to startups for two days a week and charge them a lot of money. And I remember one time the CEO coming and saying, how is this possible? And the VP of engineering said, he's doing in two days more than a full-time employee here does in a week. And was it amazing? A bit, but I wasn't, you know, super natural. I was just focused on doing what really mattered. And that's the tripling of impact that we want to see. And First of all, one example of how we got there in a company and how it looked was with a company that had a stellar product. They had really, really good people, and yet they were moving so slowly. And I came there, tried to see what was going on, and everyone were talking about, no, no, we need to make the handoffs better. If product have better specs and they hand off those good specs real, real good or we're not handing off the features to QA good enough or the handoffs between front end and back end and I came to a point where I told them okay the next person who says handoff is going to have to put some money in the jar because that's not how we work with our peers and it, this relates to previous talks here today that at the end of the day, if you're working closely with someone, if you have a lot of throughput between teams, between professions, between roles, you want to stop thinking about getting to a point where things are amazing because 
people are not APIs. We're not trying to minimize any little communication. We're people. We need to be okay with not, things not being perfect. You're not working at NASA and you can allow the spec not to be perfect. And this is, this little tip, literally this, I'm, this is not something that I'm just saying on stage, literally this helped that company ship three to four times faster. That's what their VP of product was saying when he didn't know I was there. Why? Because all of a sudden processes became easier. People stopped fighting about, no, no, you should be doing better. No, you should be giving me better specs. They just started collaborating. Magic, right? And second is this understanding that every line of code should matter. People should not be automatically opening JIRA, doing what, whatever task pops up at the top without thinking about why. Why am I handling this edge case? Is this really something that's gonna happen in the next six months or is this something that, you know, as an engineer, you know that every if has to have an else, let's code that. A lot of the times that's not really necessary when we're just starting out. That doesn't mean that you're writing bad code. It just means that you're writing code that matters and that's fine. And we need to get that sort of thinking, those why questions going on regularly. And third, we want to create an atmosphere where we maximize creativity. And that's not trivial because at the end of the day, what we're doing is we're trying to deliver results and we're optimizing for the short term. But I've seen companies where we missed out on the fact that we have, you know, you're spending a lot of time bringing very smart people in the company, paying them good money. And what are they doing? They're just being code monkeys doing what Jira is telling them every morning. And one client of mine, they were an AI company before the AI hype, they were exactly where everything should have exploded positively for them when things started a year and a half ago. And yet they missed out on all the hype and on all the new inventions that were coming up. And you know why? Because no one was listening. And I saw the emails later to this engineering manager in the company that knew, you know, what's gonna happen with Codepilot. He knew what's gonna happen with GPT, he was already there. He was trying to push exactly for these changes in the strategy and no one was listening because no, no, we don't have time to play with that, do what's on the roadmap. And six months later, when that happened and he showed those emails and how he was ignored, people were like, you know, you, you know the face palm gifts and everything, that's what was going on. And once we stopped that, you see teams were amazing ideas not always, but more often bubble up and you get to see how people's brilliance is actually used. And lastly, as leaders, and this is the most important thing, teams that get to this sort of state are a lot more fun to manage because you're less of a kindergarten teacher. You're less of a, I know managers who say, I'm a hub or I'm an abstraction layer or whatever you're telling yourself. But no, no, you're a person and you're not supposed to be the kindergarten teacher of your people. You're not supposed to always be making sure that Timmy's not playing with that toy or that they're sharing it or whatever. You're supposed to be helping your people grow. That's your intention as a leader. So how do we get there? This is like a bunch of tactics from real life, from real startups and tech companies I worked with that I think that even if you find one or two that you're gonna try and experiment with, are, are gonna make a big difference for your entire organization. So first, go back to when you were first promoted to a management position if you're like most of the companies I'm seeing, it's like how you dub a knight, right? You just tap someone on the shoulder, rise, you're now a manager, good luck. Um, if you were lucky, you got a book, maybe someone talks to you an hour a week, maybe they sent you to a nice conference for a day once a year, and you know that's better than nothing. However, you took years, for example, with engineers, you took years to become a software engineer and become proficient. However, once you turned into the management track, it's that, tap under the back, good luck, get, get going. 
And we need to understand that management is a real profession. That means that it's fine if you don't have all the answers. It's fine that you're making mistakes and learning. And even more so, you and all the managers under you need to be constantly thinking, I'm essentially a junior manager. Even if you don't have the word junior in your title, you're supposed to be growing a lot and learning a lot right now if this is your first time managing a team, if this is your first time managing managers, etc. You need to be effectively every day thinking, what did I learn? And that's fine. And if you can get some coaching, if you can get a support system, a peer group, whatever, that's amazing. But keep in mind, you're supposed to be learning. And if you're not learning, you're probably not a very good manager, right? Um, second, Management is not about reaching the deadline. Your, I, I keep asking CTOs, how can you tell that your team is a good team? And usually it's, we did what's on the roadmap. And you know, I agree, we have to be delivering value, otherwise no one needs us. But I'm talking at the meta level. This is not just about doing, you know, I'm going to McDonald's and I'm getting what I asked for. This is about the extra. And for managers, you need to be looking at yourselves and not saying, you know, I'm measured by whether my team is reaching all of its deadlines. Your product as a leader is the organization itself, right? Am I creating an organization that's constantly growing, that's getting better? And that's what you should be optimizing for all the time in your head. And that's why Ted Lasso is here, also because it's a good show. But you want to constantly be thinking about coaching. And in Ted Lasso, there are all of those examples where he's okay with the soccer slash football team missing, on a, missing out on a specific match if there's a growth opportunity here, if the team learns how to work together as a team better, learns how to collaborate. And this is something that you should always have in mind. How am I, you know, step aside from this specific outage, this specific deadline and think, what's going on? Are they learning? Should I be moving someone from here over there? And that's part of the management as a profession thinking. You're not just there to make sure everything keeps flowing. You're there to make the team better. That's your personal project. And also, we need, as an industry, to become a lot more relaxed when it comes to mistakes. Because if engineers know that if I make a mistake, I'm gonna miss the deadline, um, uh, people are gonna be mad at me, I'm not gonna get promoted, whatever, what we're gonna get, for people who care, is just code monkeys. They're just going to do what, uh, what's on the safe side, right? If any mistake is bad, I'm not gonna try anything. I remember the first time that, this is gonna show you that I'm a dinosaur, the first time that I did something for a client in AngularJS when everyone were working with Backbone or whatever, and I took the liberty of spending two, three more days to create something in Angular because I thought it's gonna pay off, and it did, okay? For them, that was a win because with Angular we shipped stuff a lot faster way back then. But if I were afraid of investing those extra two, three days, I never would have done it. I would just keep on banging my head on Backbone or Dojo, or whatever we had back then, and shipped what I knew already. And you can't get those leaps if you're afraid of, all the, of any single mistake. And this connects to the fact that creativity innovation, novelty, needs to be something that we actually make space for. All of you, I'm guessing, have a hackathon, good on you, but I, I keep saying that hackathons are like a, a hack. They're like a cage for creativity, because what are we doing? We're giving people some pizza and we're telling them, you can be creative two days a year, that's it. The rest of the time, just do what product tells you to do. And it, again, brilliant people, good money paid, we're not letting them use their brains. We're just making them do what one person wrote in the specs or just specifically what came down from management. Where's the innovation? Where's the edge that every single person can give? When I was a soldier, again, 
what was amazing is that we could inject ideas that we were learning or seeing somewhere easily. Okay, maybe a bit too easily, I accept that. Reining in a bunch of 18 year olds is not always easy, but, sorry, this is for my mom. Um, but what you really want to see is that people are okay with bringing in their own edge, thinking about things and seeing how can we show that I'm a human being, you know, each one really is a snowflake when it comes to your ideas. And I, I want to get that. I don't want to get the prima donna attitude, but I do want to get people who are actually trying new things. And this is something that we can get if we make the room for those little mistakes and if we teach people what innovation really matters. This is something that I have a huge spiel about. I'm not going to get into it right now, but again, the QR code at the end will give you a PDF from my book specifically about innovation in R&D, about creating, um, I call it intermissions, some people call it innovation weeks, uh, sabbaticals, whatever, and how we can really push for a lot more innovation in R&D with stories from real companies worldwide. Check it out later. But this is also something that I think we have to be okay with. We have to expect people not just do what they're told, but do things that they think are good opportunities. There's, there used to be, I think it's from the Austro-Hungarian army, used to be a sort of an army decoration given to soldiers who did things they were specifically told not to do, but it turned out to be a good idea. And I think that this is, should relate to that. If someone goes and tries to do something with AI and we create an internal tool that helps people, that's amazing, right? I want to see more of that. And people nowadays don't have the opportunity to do that if we just missed the hackathon that was three months ago. I'm gonna, I have to wait nine more, right? It doesn't make any sense. And also, I think that we need to create atmospheres that push people faster. If we do all, all the things I talked about, people are going to be growing naturally going to be growing faster, but we can also step it up. And that's by learning how to bring in juniors with the expectation of seeing them level up, you know, like a Pokemon, a lot faster than you're used to. A team of six mid to senior people, usually if they're in intentful and if the manager makes sure not to overprotect, can get a good, a good junior from junior to a mid-level engineer close to it in six to eight months in my experience. We don't have to remain like Peter Pan's lost boys, young forever. We can grow up a lot faster if we give people that push. You know, the theory of relativity, time moves differently for different people if you are faster. And if you bring in a junior with this good amount of attention and mentoring and coaching around, you can start creating these little subunits in your company that push out more and more experience, that make people a lot faster. And I think that this is something that the companies that I saw doing it, those are the companies that are not becoming slower as they grow, again, relating to the previous talk. Those are the companies that don't get bogged down by having all of these slower and slower processes because we're bringing on juniors, either too many juniors and letting them have three years to develop and that takes too long, or we're just focused on bringing, you know, like Google used to do, just a lot of senior people. And that just means that, you know, in a room with only senior people, no one wants to do the, the boring task, or we, all, or we have all of those ego battles. And we, I think that we need to have a good complex of seniority in a company. And if we're going back to what I talked about earlier, about that engineer, engineering manager, that knew that GPT is gonna be amazing and wasn't listened to, how did that specific person know that? What he had is something that too many of us don't have, is a direct connection to the product. He didn't think of himself just as a tech person. He always tried to see what was going on in the industry, what's important for the end users, what's going on. And as an AI company, he kept looking at what was happening in the AI world. 
we can do the same. I saw it in health tech startups and fintech startups where you get engineers who, okay, we're not supposed to be product managers, okay? But if you know what matters, if you see the results of what you're delivering, if you know what competition there is, what regulations happening, you just might get those better ideas because you're going to notice when things happen. You're going to see that, oh, that regulation connected with that thing I saw in Hacker News just might be interesting. Let, maybe let's try that. We want to create that product mastery, and that's about letting people have a direct connection to the business. Show them results, show them recordings of user interviews, connect them in a way, and this is something that I always, when I work with CPOs, VPs of product, I'm like, this is on your responsibility to make sure that people understand what we're working on. And two more things before we wrap up. Stop creating teams that are too much like Downton Abbey. If you saw it, you know, there is a servant in charge of the shoes, in charge of the buttoning, in charge of that, and we kept splitting up every little role to make sure that everyone gets their own little responsibility. And I'm seeing startups and companies forming as they grow where, okay, you're a senior, you're going to be the front-end lead. You're a senior, you're going to be the back-end lead. Senior number three is looking and saying, hey, you just split up the entire world for our team. What, what am I supposed to be doing? And this is because we're creating these zero-sum communities. Seniority doesn't mean that you're, you have to be in charge of this thing from now on and forever. It's perfectly fine to create seniority in, a, in ways of you get to be a feature owner this time, or you can try leading this little sub-team for the next quarter. Those sorts of experiences, growth opportunities, are also ways to create these seniority-inducing opportunities, creating this experience pressure cooker if we are not too focused on handing out titles and responsibilities, but instead teaching people and handing out growth opportunities. How are you going to grow? What are you going to do differently this quarter? And we're expecting to see people grow again in one quarter, two quarters, three, and not one year, two, three. And the last step being Israeli, I have to talk about that, is chutzpah. Uh, Americans say chutzpah. It's about speaking up. It's about not being afraid to tell people when they're wrong, when you have a better idea, when your boss explains something and you're like, we already tried that a year ago, why is this again on the roadmap? And this is something that is critical and as companies grow and you have more of these hierarchies, it becomes a lot more intimidating if you're not constantly thinking about breaking down the barrier of speaking up. I remember when I was 19 year old, I was a corporal in a room with a lieutenant colonel there was war going on. We had to decide about how to do something. The lieutenant colonel was saying, okay, this is how we should do it. Da, 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 I already did it in the past. And I was listening. I'm like, no, no, there's a better way to do this. Hear me out. And I just said my way. And no one was angry. I wasn't supposed to go up the chain of command. It's going to take us two weeks. I just spoke up. People were listening, saying, yeah, that makes sense. Let's do that. And that's it. And, you know, on the contrary, I didn't get any pat on the back later, like, oh, wow, you spoke up. That's just what was expected. That was the culture. Egos aside, if you have an idea, speak up. If something's not clear or it doesn't make sense for you, speak up. Uh, I have even a, you know, stupid sort of example that all of you experienced. Maybe this week, you're on a Zoom call, the person talking is you know, has sound problems for a minute, no one says anything, right? Because you're thinking the, someone else would have said it if it wasn't just on my end. A minute passes, the, the, minute, the meeting continues, no one knows what that person was saying, we're not saying anything, we're just, you know, nodding along. This is about chutzpah. Someone's remarkable stops working in the middle of the, uh, of the talk, let them know so they can fix it. We want to do that so we speak up. We're not afraid of letting people when a mistake happens or when I have an idea. And this is how we really short circuit a lot of useless work, a lot of waste. We're talking today a lot about waste and creating features that are necessary. This is what we want to do. And 
to sum all of this up, the, the lesson that I keep telling my clients is that we want to see slow and steady progress as when it comes to the shaping of your organization. No one day reorg, no one day uh, offsite is gonna fix everything. That's never the case. You need persistence and if you get that, and if in your mind you're focused on, I'm gonna do my reps every day, I'm gonna work out every day, I'm gonna try harder every day, you're gonna see how things get better and better and better in a year. And that's like the magical manager for me. Someone who doesn't look for the quick win, but knows that every day I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and let them make mistakes a bit more, even today. Even though yesterday it bit me in the ass. I'm gonna keep trying, I'm gonna let them have more opportunities because I believe it's gonna pay off. And if you have that, it's gonna pay off. That's it, thank you. The, uh, the questions are rolling in here, and we have about seven minutes for questions. Are you good for some questions? Let's do it quickly. All right, let's start at the top here. What would you do with people who don't want to grow 70% in our Thames team? Engineering is just a job for them. Well, I, first of all, there are those people who don't aspire to become the best in the world. And I get that. It's fine. It's really fine. However, I do believe that everyone needs to feel like what they're doing is good. Even if just for, you know, not getting a bad result at the end of the year when it comes to performance review, or just because, you know, my day might as well be better. With those people, I don't aim to make them triple later on. I just aim to help them make incremental upgrades to their own operating system. Can you be a bit more communicative? Can you try this new technology? And when it helps them, because I don't know, they're doing Angular, if they're gonna to move to React, it's good for the company, but it's also good for their career for the next role. When you find this alignment, that's good. I would say that if 70% of your people are in this condition, something's off, okay? There's, you know, talk to me later, because that's, that's a lot harder. Thank you. Uh, our next question, it sounds like it's coming from a dog who's looking to learn new tricks. It says, <laughs> how can we involve people who work with the same technologies and process for 10 plus years to innovate? Well, well, we all, I'm guessing almost no one here is using the same stuff you were using 10 years ago. I mean, I, I kept using Vim for so long for coding, but eventually I realized, okay, IDEs have some good stuff going on. No one here is still using the, the same coding practices they were using 10 years ago. We all know we have to move on. The, again, the question is, is the question of alignment. Where can we find opportunities where people will experiment? And this goes hand in hand with making sure that we're not afraid of mistakes. A lot of the times people get this feeling of I, I gotta keep doing what I'm comfortable with because I'm in my comfort zone and anything outside of that is putting me at risk. If you create a culture where we're experimenting together, you try this, I try that, let's talk about it later, you can get there. Again, slow and steady progress. It's not gonna, you know, you can't get people in all hands, tell them we're gonna be experimenting from now on and tomorrow it's just gonna work. No, you have to keep doing this and pushing people outside of their comfort zone, but not, you know, from here to there, but small baby steps every day until all of a sudden they got there and they didn't notice. Awesome. Our next question, I'm not sure what you make of it, but <laughs> how do you measure growth with any fluctuation? What does that mean to you? Uh, I'm guessing that it means that given that things change, it's a lot harder to isolate, right? And it, yeah, this is very subjective. You can't always tell whether someone has grown by, you know, we don't have any metric. You have grown by 20% this year. What I aim to do is kind of like you have with your feature roadmaps. I aim to see people achieve little milestones. So I know that Dave has issues speaking up. We're gonna be focusing on that for the next two months. And if at the end of the two months, we both talk about it and we see that, yeah, he did speak up here and there, et cetera, and we have some examples, that's good enough for me. This is very much a 
qualitative sort of progress as opposed to a quantitative one. We have Roland and Gabor dominating the, uh, the, the, the Slido here. Uh, how to deal with a team of, team of heroes when, it, when there's no one there to do the hard job? Well, if, uh, um, I don't understand how it goes together because usually the heroes like to swoop in and do the thing that is pr problematic. But if you have a team of heroes, you're doing well because it means that you have a lot of people who can do things. You just have to make sure that you don't have a team of siloed heroes. I'm the front-end hero, she's the back-end hero, and we never, you know, we never overlap. Make sure that you're not optimizing for the short term and you're giving the person who is not the most experienced work on X every now and again. Okay. Um, Gabor's first question, I think we only give Gabor one shot, yeah. How to create a, a creative and, in, and innovative team with a rigid old school organization? You have to create a small atmosphere that isolates the team as much as possible. So get a little bit of a buffer going on so you're not expected to work at 100% capacity and again, no one ever ha can look to the side. If I know that we're always going to be late, I'm not likely to try anything new because I'm already afraid. But if you get a little bit of a buffer and you start getting results, you know, that first time that someone has a good idea that saves us a week, that helps someone internally in the company, that helps customer success answer emails faster because you integrated some AI tool. Once you get two, three, four of those going on over two quarters, three quarters, etc., you're gonna get that extra attention. And this is the slow and steady part. You can't make the organization go, oh, yeah, yeah, sure, go ahead in a day. You have to show the results first. You have to show that what you're suggesting can actually help. And that's how you, you will eventually get the extra leeway to try more things. Great, thank you. Uh, Angela Baby has a question. Uh, how do you know if your organization is constantly growing or not without delivering? So it, you have to be delivering. The, if, uh, if you understood anything else, as I said, delivering is the basic. It's like I went to McDonald's and I got what I ordered. It has to happen, otherwise there would be no McDonald's. The growing, the growth of the team is something that we as leaders have to see in addition. You can't just say, oh, it's the end of 2023, we got everything on the roadmap or 80% of the roadmap, I'm happy. Look at your team, think about every single manager and I see and think, how much did they grow? How different are they from how they were when 2023 started, for example? And can you see that you have a team that's growing or what I call a team of Peter Pans? They're always stuck and you know, remain juniors forever. You want to see that constant growth. And this is, again, qualitative and not quantitative, usually. Okay. In our last minute question, would you be willing to talk to Gabor after the talk to give him some resources? Yes? Of course. Okay, that's a yes for Gabor. I know that there are a lot of Gabors here. Is it, do you know it's the same Gabor? Just all the Gabors. <laughs> that way we get them all. And if we could put up Aviv's um, uh, slides one more time so we can get that QR code for the newsletter. Do we have that? And while we're working on that, I'd like to present you your yeah. gift. We have that, some, you'll get a PDF you want. That's it. We have some fancy tea for you, first of all. Thank you. And a lovely artist rendering of you. There you are. And there it is for the audience and the people at home. Please give a round of applause for Aviv, everybody.